No in-studio drumming. I was giving a little tip, toe tap. Hey, we're doing the, the Lancaster tap. Connects intro. <laughs> I was stepping it up. A little, catchy little tune there. A little, little more. I'll give it a little hardcore metal edge. Like. Double bass. Yeah. He's a little bit country. I'm a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> I think it's the other way around. Well, well yeah, as of later. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> Well, you know, that would mean, that would mean I'm Marie and you're gone. Yeah, you know, whatever. It's, it's, I don't know if I'm... At one point, we were peaches and herb. So yes. Yes. Or herb. Is it herb or herb? Peaches and herb. I think herb. Herb, yeah. Herb, herb is what you herb put is on, what, like, your... What grows in the ground. Yeah, right. right, right. Yeah. Well, uh, the, clock, the herb, clock is ticking, Jeff. Herb and peaches saying back in a New York mood, which is actually appropriate for our guests. We'll touch on that. In a oh, minute. that's true. How'd you like that? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty sweet. This guy. <laughs> Once you get to your last in-person show for a little bit. I got to leave it all out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. got to leave it all out in the field. All the steps. Got to leave it all out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, listen, thanks for watching Lancaster Connects. This is a show about small business success, charity success, people doing great things here in Lancaster County because our purpose is to help our community thrive, be more productive, wake up happier. Part of that is shining light on great people, helping our county help others. We've got a great guest for you today. Comment, like, share the show on all the social channels you might be watching it on, wherever you've got internet, wherever you can watch video. If you search Lancaster Connects, we're likely to come up. We're that big of a deal now. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I uh, can watch on the Gardeners channel, Facebook and, and YouTube, and also uh, personal LinkedIn channels, right? Yep. All over the place. Um, and commenting during the show, we'll win you a gift. Wins prizes. Uh, of course, you have to be the winner that the prize later picks at Correct. the end of the show. Uh, but we spin the prize later and one commenter... On the go win. bundle, sleep bundle is prize choice one. Coffee tumbler prize choice two. Almost spilled the water. Hydro flash three. I have another one over here that almost spilled. And so, comment, comment away. Get yourself into the prize later. We'll spin that at the end. It's great. Speaking of New York, Great back in the New York mood, in the New York mood, from New York, now helping Lancaster out, the wonderful Vanessa Filbert from Community Action Partnership Lancaster. Good. At what time is it? Good afternoon. It is afternoon. It is. <laughs> I was trying to and figure out. And our clock is ticking. If you were country yeah. and he was rock and roll, I guess I'd be hip hop. Sure. There you go. Sure. I we, like it. We got all the bases covered. Yep, they, do they do mashups. They do. They do mashups like they that. They do. Yeah, they do. Little Run DMC back in the day. There was a mashup there. Yeah, uh, that's that was right. A, Aerosmith and, uh, yeah. and Run DMC. Yeah. Yeah. There was a little like thirteen minute documentary on that song that I ran across mm. a couple weeks back. So there you go. Oh, look at that. Well, thanks for having yeah. me. Yeah. You're so welcome. Vanessa. Um, you mentioned to us pre-show you're from the New York area mm -hmm. and moved to Lancaster at some point. When uh, when did that uh, move happen for you? Yeah, uh, we moved here in 2002. So February of 2002. So 21 years now, uh, we've been here in the Lancaster community. That's awesome. And, the, and it, it was an interesting time. We moved from Brooklyn to New Holland. Oh, okay. think, <laughs> right. think, a, think a little bit about that. Just take that in for a minute. Two. Pretty different areas of the the country, I guess, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much so. You exchange the uh, yellow taxi for a, a black buggy. Yeah, That's, and right. a, you know, it was you an some... interesting time. It's some whoopie pies. It's been good. <laughs> I have to say it. You put some clip clop in your hip hop. <laughs> he is really Man. here today it, for all of it. On... On point. I'm bringing it all, Vanessa. I have, this is my last show for a few weeks. I have knee surgery coming up next Monday and I'll be out for, I'm not sure how many, how long, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah. No, Jeff, I would, I would be really impressed if you sang happy birthday to our, our oh, guest who is celebrating her 29th birthday. Not happening. Not happening. We'll say okay. happy birthday. Right. Thank you. Thank happy you for 29th that. birthday. Yeah. I'll take 29 a few times over. It's fine. Thank you there so you much go. for the birthday love. I appreciate it. Yeah. And the little birthday. I saw it. It yeah. was great. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me happy. I'm, I'm a simple man, Vanessa. Just like, just well, splash the confetti, like smile on my face. It's all Yeah, good. it's all okay. it takes. I'm here for it. Yeah. 
So Vanessa, you're here to talk about the Community Action Partnership, yeah. of which you are the CEO mm -hmm. of, I believe, right? Yep. Uh, tell us what the Community Action Partnership is all about. Sure. Thanks again for having me. Um, I'll maybe give you a little bit of a broad view and then bring it in local. So community actions are part of a national network of organizations that are committed to anti-poverty strategies. Um, and what has been kind of what the history that's connected to for community actions really started through the work of our former president, Lyndon Johnson. So Johnson, um, you know, was curious about a few things, but really was curious about poverty who was impacted, what was causing it, and what kind of interventions could be put in place. So um, there was a gentleman by the name of Sergeant Shriver um, that he sent out to kind of travel the U.S. and to get a sense of what was happening in communities here um, across the country. And Shriver came back to D.C. and basically said, kids are most impacted and generational poverty is the most perverse, and really started to think about ways to create solutions. And one of the ways that he did that was creating new programming. So programs like Head Start and Peace Corps and Legal Services and Community Actions were birthed out of that kind of movement in 1965. Mm -hmm. So there's legislation called the Economic Opportunity Act that kind of mobilized this network of organizations. And the spirit of community action is to really be connected to their local community, um, to be paying attention to themes, data, trends, concerns, and do something a little different, which is look for community level solutions versus cookie cutter solutions across a broader kind of federal lens. So today there are about a thousand community actions across the United States. Um, there are 52 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and our cap community action is the countywide community action. So we serve Lancaster City and Lancaster County. So that's kind of the heart of the mission of our work is really to create a place where People can experience equity and justice um, and prosperity. But what we believe is just a little bit of the language that you all used uh, in your intro is that families should have a place where they can thrive. Um, and so everything that we do is kind of connected to that heart mission about thriving. Very good. I did not know the history of that. That's yeah, very interesting. Well, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. So one of the benefits of that history is that that legislation um, provides an allocation of resources that comes to our local community. Um, based on census data. So that census data is really important. So when you guys ever think about doing a show again and it's census time, really engaging people in the census is so important because mm. it gives us real-time data that does help with kind of allocations and funding that comes to communities. So we receive a little over a million dollars for Lancaster County based on that census data. Um, mm. And then we're responsible oh, wow. um, <laughs> to basically do a community needs assessment every three years. And that needs assessment helps us to really direct our work plan and how we strategize to create change in the community. Yeah. So census is every 10 years. Yeah. And I think we had the last one in 20. Yeah. So, so if you're still, right? I mean, you might be nationally syndicated by then. Whatever's happening. We might be. Talk hey, about with, it. look, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm saying with clip clop and hip hop, it's those kinds of deliverables. <laughs> it's going to get that, you there. It's going to get you there. That's, that's, that's what does it. Yep. I'm telling you, it's, it's that kind of, it's that kind of go at it that makes it happen. But, uh, really great historical perspective. And I do, I always like when larger government entities mm -hmm. allow feet on the ground, people mm -hmm. at the front to say, here's what we need as opposed to here's, as opposed to what you feel the answer is. Yeah. And what's beautiful I about always the, like hearing that. the work that we've been doing here in Lancaster is that this local community action has been um, here since 1966. Uh, we started on Rockland Street um, here in Lancaster City. And today we have about 300 team members that are part of our team. We serve about 40,000 customers a year. And we do that in a lot of different ways, a lot of different programs. But we also kind of, you know, are able to be in multiple geographic locations throughout Lancaster County. So we have offices in Ephrata and Coryville here in Lancaster City, um, in Columbia Borough. And then we have satellite classrooms. We have about 45 different classrooms for early learner learners all across Lancaster County. So lots of services, some mobile wow. services. So we really um, have been really intentional about creating reach across the county. So you said 66, 1966 it was? Yeah, 1966 here so in Lancaster. So you were, Lancaster County's cap was... 
an early adopter, mm-hmm. early adopter. based on the, the history you just gave us. Yeah. And it was interesting because it wow. was also kind of a really grassroots feeling, you know, think about the 60s and the heart of what was happening in our country around civil rights um, and, yep. and voter registration rights. So all of that was happening at the same time. So when you think about the core mission for us around equity and justice, it's really important and directly connected to prosperity because we will never disrupt generational poverty without really digging deep into and dismantling racism and the oppressive systems that exist there. So there's something um, for me that always feels kindred to going back to that time and saying there was a lot happening in the world in the 1960s. Um, and this kind of idea was birth. And I, it, it, it just draws me to the place of remembering why we're here today, which is we're still doing that work. I mean, things have changed and then some things haven't changed and we're still kind of at it. So that, that connection is right. meaningful. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, current state of poverty in Lancaster County and city um, and, and why programs like the ones offered by the Community Action Partnership are essential uh, for uh, the impoverished community? Yeah, and I think what, I, what I'll start to say is, you know, when we think about poverty, sometimes we have pictures in our mind, you know, of kids who are hungry and maybe you know, those international footage that we see. Mm -hmm. And we Mm -hmm. don't always maybe recognize that poverty um, (laughs) is pervasive, but it also is connected to people who are working hard every day. So um, I think some folks maybe have this idea that people who are poor are not working and not contributing to, you know, the economic world that we live in. But many of our customers and many folks who are living in low-income conditions go to work every day. Um, and they are just not earning enough. And, you know, that is complicated in itself, but it's not always about folks who are just not contributing to the economic vitality of our community. It is about family sustaining wages and, you know, what it costs to live these days and all those things. So currently, um, you know, our analysis of Lancaster County continues to, you know, um, have pockets in the community where there's more poverty than other parts. So places maybe southern, lower part of the county, southern end, Coryville, right? We know there's some rural par- poverty there. Columbia Borough also a place where we have seen data tell us that there's, you know, poverty that has stayed pretty steady in that space, pretty high. Um, you know, Lancaster City, people make lots of assumptions about. And yeah, Lancaster City does have concentrated poverty. Um, Census Track 9, which is the Duke Street corridor of Lancaster City, has the most concentrated poverty in our county. Um, but mm-hmm. really directly connected to redlining. So it's really interesting to watch those kind of remnants from decades ago kind of still hold true in that space. But an area mm-hmm. that was surprising in our current data was really the Elizabethtown area. Um, so increased poverty in that space and just in terms of employability and what jobs are available. So I think those are the things when you okay. think about poverty, you're thinking about you know, employment, transportation, education, early childhood services, because you need all those things to get people to work. Um, so that's right. the way that we try to approach um, just the curiosity with communities around like what's here, what's missing, what's causing gaps to your employment. Is it credentials and criteria? Is it transportation and childcare? Like what are the barriers? Um, because ultimately, if we want thriving communities, we need to have thriving workplaces. Um, those things have to counter exist, you know, coexist with each other. Yeah. Um, on the topic of Columbia, mm-hmm. as an example, um, so we know Columbia locally is is kind of seeing a rebirth mm-hmm. in the waterfront, right? There's there's been some more investment in business there. Have you seen? And it's always trail things like that. Always trail. Mm-hmm. I I think is a fair statement. Are we beginning to see improvement from the reinvestment in that in that part of the county? Yeah, I mean, I think we'll see it for sure. I think it takes time. I, I, I'm always like right, okay. remembering and trying to remind myself of my own lived experience. So um, I think Columbia is emerging. There's lots of good pr- um, investments and businesses going to Columbia and new housing being built, which is so, so important. Um, it's got a great location in terms of right off of 30 and that kind of accessibility piece. Um, but I know that, that that community is still curious about ways to create supports and bridges for, you know, their residents. Um, I also know that Columbia is a place where, um, you know, lots of families have been there for generations. 
Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And, you know, they have a pretty solid community. So we've got to continue to support them and think about what solutions look like. We've been doing some work with some of their um, council members over the last few months, just learning more about their needs. So I would say, yeah, you'll probably see more of that like any other place um, with some time. I think when I think about my personal story, my grandparents came to the States, you know, in the, I don't know, maybe in the 1950s from Puerto Rico um, because they, you know, believed that there was an opportunity here in the States that didn't quite exist in Puerto Rico. Um, and they came here with seven children, not speaking English, not educated in the way that we understand education here in the States. Um, and it has taken, you know, two generations for for my generation to be the thing that they dreamed about when they got here. Um, mostly all of us professional or skilled trade jobs, all college educated, but that took a long time, you know, so their right. children navigated the world in the States and learned some things, but they didn't really get the benefit of, you know, um, middle class goodness that they thought they were going to get right away. It takes some time. So that's the same thing we have to think about when we think about interventions. It takes yep. multiple generations to make the impact. Yep. And you, you, one of our great fans and supporters, Jonna Hoover Green, maybe, do you know Jonna? I don't think I do, but maybe I do because sometimes, okay. you know, there we go. 29 times two gets old. So <laughs> <laughs> notice who laughed and who didn't. I oh, just kind of oh. let those, I kind of let those comments I settle. Mean, and such I just, a gentleman, such a gentleman. I just, you're going national. I'm, I'm staying low. This well, guy here just know, can't I'm, help. I'm just, um, so <laughs> just, and, and we'll keep the conversation going, but I, you know, I think, I think we would miss an opportunity. Um, given the month that we're in, mm -hmm. you brought up redlining mm -hmm. um, on on the that Duke Street corridor, yeah. and you know maybe some of maybe some of our people listening who might eventually listen to this never heard what that term is. Mm -hmm. So why don't you share? Yeah, I'm gonna do my term, but I'm gonna be appropriate and make sure that I don't misspeak. So because technology is right in front of us, I'm just gonna make sure I have the right term and how it's kind of talked about. So um, redlining can be defined as a discriminatory practice that consists of sy systemic denial of services um, related to home ownership. So mortgages, investments, insurance mm -hmm. loans, those kinds of things. So um, there was a time in which there was a strategy kind of in place to really think about how investments and wealth was created and shared. And redlining was a practice. Now, one of the things that changed is that, the you know, the housing market and the federal government basically said that form of discrimination is not okay. Um, and they put lots of great rules in place around what that looks like today. Um, and have been in place since probably the 1960s or 70s. I'll have to make sure that I can fact check that for you all in terms of when those laws kind of were enacted. I think what we learned is, is that, um, what it didn't do, it didn't go back and course correct that for those families who were in that system prior. So when you think about black and brown families, you know, prior to when there was discrimination policies around housing enacted, um, who didn't have the ability to have access wealth, to purchase their homes, to be in the same space, because we know that from an asset building perspective, having an asset like your home is one of the most valuable things a family can have in terms of generational sure. wealth. So when that system was create was around and folks that look like me, black and brown folks in this community were denied access to wealth building. You know, there was a change made because that was discriminatory. However, there was no going back in time and saying, hey, all of you who were impacted by that, we're going to course correct that for you now. So, you know, whether that was kind of predatory loan lending, higher interest rates, devaluing of properties in those communities, all of those effects were still in place, even though the future of that industry was starting to shift because of some of those laws. Um, but there is a lot to learn. I think, you know, to your point, um, this is Black History Month, um, and it's a great opportunity to get a little bit more curious about, you know, what yeah. what the history of the world <clears throat> looks like. Um, I've been actually just watching the 1619 Project on Hulu. It's, you know, kind of a documentary piece. Um, and I always encourage people to really get curious. Um, and that solidarity work, allyship, really starts with just curiosity. Um, and that's kind of the most beautiful part of the journey yeah. is just learning and asking questions um, and really coming to it from a place of 
this commitment to creating good communities for each other. Um, I deeply believe in humanity, you know, and the human experience. Um, and I know we all have different experiences and that's totally okay. Um, that's part of the beauty of who we are as people. But this curiosity helps us build bridges that bring us a little closer together um, and maybe help us get a little bit more creative about what solutions are needed. Yeah. I really wish, um, um, and we're deviating from our script here. Oh, correct. So I'm sorry. I was, I was, that's okay. I was like, no, I, I'm, I'm doing it. It's, it's always it. my fault. Oh, okay, yeah, right. great. It's always, it's always me. It's my fault. I, I really wish I had this with me now. It's at home. Maybe I should think to bring it in. Um, so my grandfather was, uh, w- would have loved what you just shared and he lived it. So he was, uh, in the book business, book publishing, That's book cool. distribution, retail bookstores. He developed something called the book bus. And this goes back in the sixties and seventies. And, he lived uh, in the Philadelphia area, uh, was emigrated to Quakertown, orphaned into, you know, basically child labor as oh. an orphan uh, in Quakertown and then found his way, you know, Bucks County into the city uh, as a young man. But uh, he would do, uh, he'd bring fresh air kids out to the farm as yeah. an adult later in life. But this book bus, he would bring around and he had a program where you could buy a book, give a book. So cool. Um, and he was very, but he was very intentional about the give a book. He said, give a book to, to, a, lo- to a local library, not your local library, a local mm. library. Well, that local library was libraries in the city. Oh, great. In the city of Philadelphia at the time. And, um, and he did that very intentionally because he knew, he knew that those schools didn't, didn't get the same access to learning and yeah. books as the suburban schools. And these things happen and it's unfortunate, but I'm glad we, I'm glad we got to touch on it because. Yeah. Um, it just, it's just a part of history that exists. And Mm -hmm. if we talk about it and we come together, like you said, and we're more curious, it's good. Yeah, I agree. I think that's great. I mean, lots of opportunity for learning and curiosity with each other. We've been on our own journey here as an organization. I'm really getting kind of more open and clear about what equity looks and feels like, how it comes alive in our organization, you know, the places that we need to grow, um, and the places that maybe we are kind of cutting edge, but it takes kind of a constant internal view. Um, you know, so for me, I'm the first, you know, Afro-Latina woman to lead this agency in its history. So you think from 1966 mm-hmm. until 2019, when I became the CEO, um, the organization was run by, you know, a white man. Not a bad thing, just, the, you know, that's the history of it. Um, do I bring a different perspective to the work? For sure. Um, and for lots of reasons, because of my lived experience, because of, you know, my race, gender, all the things, um, and because of my own lived story. So, you know, when I first came to Lancaster, I was connected to CAP because I was a customer. I had grown up in a single family house. Um, I was a teen parent. I had left high school pretty early to join the workforce. And when we moved here, we really needed a lot of support as we were kind of both working, but not earning quite enough. Um, and I remember my very first connection to CAP was through WIC, which is one of our programs. Um, so I have a lot of kind of empathy and I hold deep, I don't know, I, would, I feel a deep sense of responsibility to do the work mm-hmm. and to do it well, um, because I know what it's like to sit in our waiting room, right? So those lived experiences right. are really important because they help kind of inform how we show up for one another. Um, and that's really been the biggest privilege of my career so far is kind of having that full circle moment here at Cap. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. So like you see, I've seen often memes, meme pictures of somebody that had um, like a, a part-time worker tag mm-hmm. at McDonald's. And then like you see all the name tags, yeah. you know, manager, supervisor, okay. you know, manager, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. then finally owner, yeah. right? So that's kind of your story, which is very, it's very cool. Yeah. You know, I have a lot and, of gratitude for it. Yeah. And you worked your, and you, you know, you worked for it. You worked to elevate and, but that also came with opportunity mm-hmm. um, for those around you to focus on. We do need those bridges. We do need those supports. Yeah. And to really, so, you know, think about what it takes to lead at a different level. I mean, for me, I went back to school at 30. <laughs> so when I left high school, my junior year, you know, I kind of went to the workforce and then, you know, I knew that I was curious about what could be next for me. But in the work that I was doing in the community benefits sector, 
you know, having that credential is important. Um, so yeah, I went down that route. Um, and where, when you think about equity, it's also thinking about, you know, in what places can we exchange credential for experience and what place can we help build a pathway to the credential? So that's part of that equity work as well, but it's been, it's been a great time. Yeah. That's such an interesting statement because I'm of the belief that our world is shifting away from certification mm-hmm. to competency. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you need to really look no further. Like right now, uh, AI platforms are all the rage. Mm-hmm. And it, so it's really quest- beginning to question a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you, well, you can pass a Harvard law exam by typing in the questions to chat GPT, which somebody just did apparently. Like, you know, you don't necessarily need that certification, yeah. but that still means you need to be able to argue and interpret the law fairly and justly. Yeah. So that's the that's the competency part. Yeah. Right? And, um, but I love that our conversation went there. So let's get to uh you you said you um I believe you used WIC as one mm-hmm. of the programs. Yeah. And there's four. Yep. So why don't we have We'll kind of start a little off script, if that's okay. Totally fine. He writes our script. Oh, so I always, like, I always need to make he's sure. He's like, she's never coming back again. That's fine. <laughs> no worries. No, he's he's just looking forward to the next few weeks where if he gets to do what he wants, and I don't, I don't upend it. Yeah, this is what There'll I need to do. My team. my team is usually right. like, we're gonna give her a script, and she's not gonna say anything. And I'm like, just give me a few bullets, and then we'll go from there. So yeah. Um. So her current cap functions with four impact areas. Um, and I can give you an overview of what those impact areas are and how they're kind of connected to this idea of economic mobility. So we have an education and child development team. That team really focuses on early learners. So kids under five years old. Um, and it's really focused on a few things. It's really thinking about how do we create high quality early ed experiences? Look at those babies. Um, for kiddos, right? Um, and we do that from birth to five. We have four licensed childcare facilities as part of our portfolio of services. We have about 1,200 students in our Head Start programming. So Head Start is one of those initiatives that came out of that conversation and that history of uh, President Johnson. And really, you know, to its to its name, it is about giving kids a head start and making sure that individuals who are families who are under the 150% poverty threshold have access to high quality childcare. Um, so that's what the Head Start program does. Um, parents as teachers is the home visitation program that supports about two to 300 families a year in really teaching parents how to be their kid's first teacher. Um, and that fundamentally parents are their kid's first teacher. So we want to make sure that parents are equipped with understanding social, emotional, physical, um, kind of, you know, what it looks like to help support kids. And the way that we do that is with coaches. So coaches partner with parents. They do a home visit. They do lots of curriculum and sharing, and then parents get to practice um, and see their kids kind of develop in real time. This is a national program that has such beautiful um, outcomes because what we know is true is that early intervention happens sooner for families who have home visitation happening because we get to do those interventions earlier. And those kids are just more ready. They're more ready for kindergarten. Um, and we know that that first few years of a kiddo's life is so, so important. So that's our kind of our education team. We also host a countywide conversation with our 16 school districts to help build coordination of process, um, systems, assessments, and just philosophy around early ed, because we know that we have transient families within this county. So if we can do a little bit more collaborating across districts, families a little bit more ready. Um, So that's our education team. Our health team does what we talked about with WIC. Women, Infants, and Children. It is a food supplement program for individuals and families. Um, so mothers who are pregnant and infants up to five years old, again, in that program, creating food access. Um, we also have, um, we are the lead agency for food pantries here in Lancaster County. So we support about 40 food pantries across the county. Um, and okay. we kind of, in that space, anywhere between 1.5 to 2 million pounds of food a year, we transition in those pantries. Um, and it's, you know, it happens in all parts of Lancaster County, not just, you know, they're just locations everywhere. Um, we have two yeah. senior centers. We're really focused on making sure that individuals who are over 55, um, who are low income can age with dignity and support. Um, and we do that both in Columbia and in Lancaster City. 
And then uh, we have lots of nutrition education that we do all across the county in all different ways. So whether it's in a community service hub or a pantry or a school district, we're providing nutrition ed all across. Um, and nutrition's a big deal. It's a big deal in terms of, you know, how people um, experience the world in th- that they live in because it helps impact their health. Um, and we know that low-income communities often have um, don't have quite the right access to quality, nutritious food. So it's one of the things yeah. that we do there. And then the last two are really focused on two kind of community ideas. One is safety and empowerment. So we're the countywide provider for domestic violence services. So we have a safe house, or formerly known as a shelter for anyone fleeing domestic violence in real time who needs a safety plan. We have a transitional living experience where we have a 10-unit apartment building for families who need housing stability while they're kind of making that transition. Um, we have a gratis legal clinic with legal, uh, with attorneys, paralegals, and advocates who do all the legal work for a survivor and their family. Um, education, counseling, all those kinds of things are part of our legal work. Um, and, you know, really kind of such an important service to this community. Um, and we are the only organization that that's one of our main goals is really making sure that families are safe. Um, so that's part yeah. of our safety and empowerment team. And then in 2018, we had the opportunity to merge with a local community center called Christmas Addicts Community Center. Kind of, you know, exciting because it's Black History Month. But the center was its own organization for many, many years. Um, it'll be here in Lancaster almost 100 years um, and then next year. So it's been around a really long time. Um, and the heart of the center is to make sure that there is a space and a voice for Black and Brown issues, history, and culture. Um, that they are a hub to their neighborhood because they're here down in the southeast part of the corridor of Lancaster City. Um, and that they are helping to develop leadership opportunities for individuals of color as they think about whether it's school board or PTA or public office, that we create representation um, across, you know, our county and our neighborhoods kind of work. So that's kind of the center. But the last team is really focused on economic mobility. Um, and that's really, I feel it feels just at the heart of our work. So it's this idea that we're all on a journey. Um, and for some of us, like me, when I got started, I was just trying to kind of get stable. So we start, maybe some families are in crisis. We want those families to move to a place of stability. For stability, we want them to strive. Um, and then we want them to thrive. So we do a lot of work around like utility assistance and rental assistance and childcare subsidy. Those are kind of that crisis to stability work. But the, per- the work that's really feeling the most transformative is this whole family approach. Um, and it lives in our kind of long-term navigation work, which is really helping family navigate towards their dreams for what they want for themselves and what they want for their families. Um, the way that we talk about that here is really called two-gen or whole family approach. Um, and it is a coaching model that supports a family holistically looking at kids and adults and their goals and making sure that the adults have access to credentialing and career pathways that, you know, are aligned to what they want to do and and can create family sustaining wages for their family while ensuring that their kids have that early childhood experience or K-12 to experience that meets their needs and that we can holistically look at that family's ability to thrive through the lens of wealth and asset building and social capital building. So kind of at our core, you know, we believe in everyone's journey, but we're trying to create an undergird, a space for families that says, you know, we know that we can't think about the long term. I was my experience. If I'm just trying to survive, it's hard to dream about what I want to do and right. who I want to be because I'm just trying to figure out how to feed my kids and keep my lights on, right? Um, yeah. But if we can create capacity for people by creating that stability and then engage with families from a place of partnership, um, and that's the big, we've done a lot of training with our staff probably the last 18 months around our own mindset as practitioners. Because sometimes those of us who are in the community benefit sector feel like, I, I'm going to help you. I'm a helper. That's my, I'm wired to help. That's who I am as a person, right? Um, but the way that I do that with dignity is to say, I'm going to ask permission. And you're driving. What do you want for you and your family? And then how can I support you? How can I help you discern what, what might get in the way and create those kind of bridges to those spaces so that you don't get derailed? Because I know for me, um, I would have done anything to maintain stability for my girls before I would have thought about dreaming about going back to school, even though I know the long-term game would have worked, right? That there's, there's right. you know, value proposition there. But in the immediate, it feels like a big risk. 
that you just yeah. don't have capacity for. So I think what we feel really grateful to be doing here is to create the space for families just to dream a little bit um, and to have hope again and about what they want for themselves and any way that we can support families to do that. That's kind of the mission of the work. Yeah, you shared a few things um, there around the mission of Christmas Attic Center uh, and what you just maybe shared for the last four or five minutes. It really sounds like your work is to, you know, create some security, mm -hmm. st stability, inspiration, but then ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not our like song. You, right, I'm going to ask permission. Mm -hmm. and, and that answer becomes the ownership of the person in front of you. Yeah. And it's about and power with, not power over, right? So this idea of like, I engage with you in the power of your story versus I'm going to prescribe to you the solutions. Um, because I think inherently what it tells someone is that like, you're broke. I'm going to fix you. I'm going to tell you how to fix it. Um, and there is a space for us as practitioners to be a resource. That is super valuable, right? Because we should be well-resourced and understand how this network works where the challenges are in the network. We should be able to be authentic and honest with our customers around that. Um, but I think what we're learning is that client voice has to be centered in our work because it is their life. And sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. families aren't ready to do, they're just trying to get through the day and we've got to respect that until they're ready. Um, and believe me, um, life's complicated. We all have had things happen that we did not expect to happen. Um, you know, I think 2008 was an interesting time. 2020, 21 has been an interesting time where we've had families accessing resources that would have never been a CAP customer before. Mm -hmm. um, and part mm -hmm. of that is just helping people work through any maybe shame that they feel about that and just saying, this is a place for support. Um, and right. it doesn't, there should be no shame connected to that. So our job is to make sure that we show up um, with a lot of compassion. Um, and care for that work because, you know, it is important that people feel seen and valued um, and that they feel um, that it is their story to tell, you know, and that we understand that it's a privilege to be a part of that story. We make no assumptions about that. Yeah. Vanessa, um, so uh, Jana, who yeah. uh, has been commenting, mentioned uh, Christy, yeah. um, who's, uh, I know, a, a cap, um, a, Chief Development yeah, Officer, I think Christy is. We love Christy. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I know you have a fantastic team. I mean, the the amount of services you offer is just unbelievable. I don't know if you keep them all straight. Um, just just an uh, amazing program you have there. Um, just maybe talk a little bit about the the staff that that mm -hmm. you have there. How many people work at Cap? Yeah, uh, and and then and also share the impact that they have on. Uh, the people. What is the impact to the folks in Lancaster? Oh my gosh, services? yeah. So today we have about 300 staff across, you know, all of our programming. Um, and, you know, I have nine direct reports that are part of our senior leadership team. Christy is one of those folks who helps really lead our work around developing um, and friend raising and fundraising, which is a big deal, a part of what we do here. But when we think about the work of our team, um, I always feel like, you know, we've got the best of the best here. And that's one of our strategic goals is to be the best place to work in Lancaster County. And we're working on it. Um, we have not perfected that, but we are working hard. Um, so that, you know, when you think about different teams, what I'll, I'll give you a few stats. So um, our education team is the largest team. It's about 150 team members who are part of the education team. Um, that really functions in itself. <laughs> like a school district, I have to be very honest. It is a lot to coordinate, um, but they are serving, you know, over 1,500 students and all different kinds of early learning experiences and home visitation programs and all those kinds of things. Um, so that's maybe our largest team in terms of size. Our health and nutrition team is really, it has the biggest volume of impact in terms of numbers. So when you think about WIC, women, infants, and children, they alone serve 10,000 customers. So just that one program. Um, so they've got this big scope around numbers served. Um, and then the other two teams are really interesting because they hold kind of the spirit of the work in our economic mobility work. And then we have these two kind of unique community initiatives that impact the work in really different ways. Um, so, you know, we've got folks who have been with us a really long time. I have someone on our team who's been with us 42 years. Um, mm. you know, and, and has seen us when we were over on Rockland Street to this building and has been around for all of it. 
Um, and then I have folks who just will onboard next week for orientation. Um, I try to host a quarterly um, lunch with all new hires. So I get a little FaceTime with everybody when they first get on board with us. Um, and we just hosted a really fun um, holiday party, which we haven't had in a while because of COVID. But we had like 200 of our staff and their family and we had a great time and we were on the dance floor the whole night because that's how we like to do it. <laughs> that's great. That's great. Well, um, my wife is a is a very happy CAP employee. Oh. Uh, she's been with uh, uh, CAP for uh, about nine years now in the Women, Infants, and Children program. And I know she just loves the work that she yeah. does and well, we're you know, everybody uh, involved there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, obviously, uh, you know, CAP can't do everything alone by themselves. Uh, and, and like so many others that we've highlighted on Lancaster Connects over the last couple of years, you know, in different uh, parts of the county, you coordinate with many other organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could share a few of the organizations yeah. that you um, connect people with and are connected to. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I would say back in 2015, we went through a name change. Um, so what we did was we used to be the Community Action Program, and then we moved to Community Action Partnership because we recognized that partnership was essential to our work internally. So we're doing a lot more kind of internal collaboration but more importantly to our partners work and partnership and being a good partner is a value that we want to live into. So we partner with organizations like Tenfold or the Redevelopment Authority of the city of Lancaster with county, you know, county commissioner's office with our municipalities, um, central PA food bank. There are so many. Um, and because CAP does a little bit of everything, our partnership kind of tentacles reach far and wide. Um, because we can be in a lot of different conversations. I think what we've learned over the years is that there's an opportunity for us to lead. And then there's sometimes an opportunity for us to be supportive in the background, have a small space. But we recognize um, that collaboration and partnership is, to your point, the best way that we can get things done for the Lancaster community because that one organization can do it all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you touched on... Um on the topic of poverty, you touched on Elizabethtown and we had, I'm not good with this, but who, what was the group that Echoes. we had? Oh, Echoes. Echoes. Yeah, we had great. Echoes on. Brie, yeah. Brie Anderson? Yeah, Brie, she's their executive yeah. director. She's great. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, we've had Brad Peterson on from Power Packs. Yeah. And Claire House was yep. on two, weeks, weeks, ago, two yeah. weeks ago. Two weeks ago or so. All and, you know, like, they all kind of, they, yeah, they're all your partners. Everything kind of oh, weaves Mm -hmm. weaves together this uh, tapestry of support, I guess you would say. Yeah. Um, Great so, yeah, very neat how you all work together. Is there ever is there ever a time where you're competing like head-to-head -head for grants or anything oh, like that? I'm sure there are. I mean, we try to be thoughtful about like highest and best use, but there's always going to be a little bit of that competition, especially in the community benefit sector. Um, I think we try to, you know, think about opportunities to collaborate and maybe do grants together. Um, sometimes yeah. it's like, hey, you know, we had this with the emergency rental assistance program that was part of um, an intervention for COVID is that our redevelopment authority was the assigned kind of contractor, but then partnered with us and with some other folks tenfold. So, you know, we find our way and we don't always have to be the lead. We can figure out our fit. Um, and then sometimes, you know, there is a little bit of competing and, you know, this healthy competing is fine. Um, I think our job from, you know, when you think about resource equity is to ensure that like, if we're going to be in the space that we feel like we've got the best, you know, intention application that we can put the best effort. And if we don't feel like it's our thing, then we don't need to apply for it. You know, so sometimes it's right, like, right. you got to know like, oh, we're going to sit this one out and that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now's a good time to talk about um, or, and ask, how can the community support oh my gosh, yeah. and other programs similar to it? I would say, you know, anyone who's interested to learn more, our social media, our um, director of communications, um, Brie Wynn, does a phenomenal job keeping our social media up to date and giving a lot of variety of stories and the ways that folks can get engaged. We have people who volunteer at our food pantries. We have individuals who volunteer through our domestic violence program or who want to read to kids in classrooms. So there's lots of those tangible kind of, I'm looking for a volunteer opportunity. Um, I always think about, you know, three things, time, talent, and treasure. Um, so it's your, if your time, if there's a talent that you have in terms of, you know, committee work or board engagement or whatever that looks like or special event planning. Some people like to contribute their talent to an organization. 
And then, you know, there's yeah. always opportunity for, you know, for that kind of treasure donation. Um, what I, what I will say to people often is that I think people look at the scope and the size of CAP and maybe think we don't need those extra resources, but we really do. Um, and, and I'll tell you what's different about it. I think for us, what we need is the flexibility that donor dollars bring, which is the space where we can innovate programming and supports for families that are not as prescribed as when we get contracts from the federal and state government, right? Because they come with kind of um, a lot of parameters. So we have so much gratitude for our donors who are really just allowing us to get creative um, and to do some of this whole family work in a way that support families in real time or innovating a new idea that might be cutting edge, letting us to take risks um, as we do our work. So you know, engaging with us in any of those ways, your time, your talent, or your treasure is really going to help um, yield good fruit for Lancaster. And I also say sometimes we don't have a volunteer opportunity, but we know a partner who does and we will make a referral. Or if someone says, hey, I'm really interested in this kind of experience and that's not something we can offer, we can usually connect them to a partner agency who does that. Yep. And I love that you brought up talent because we often talk about time. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about if you can donate money, great. Often organizations will take money happily, but uh, some of the smaller organizations always need time to affect the mission. Yeah. But the talents, that's one we've left out and shame on me. Uh, and I'm so glad you brought it up because we had on the screen like graphic design, mm -hmm. you know, editing. Uh, those are, those are talents that'll, yeah. yeah, that a lot of people have. And um, it's always good to think about it that way. You can talent donate some of your talent mm, as yeah. well. Yeah. So maybe you can't make it out for a Saturday morning effort. Right. Whatever that effort might be, but you can you can work if you like to, you know, work in the late hours of the night and you can do some editing and you can do some look at some spreadsheets for finance. Yeah. That's where I know the finances go spreadsheets and it stops there for me. Yeah, that's um, all right. But uh but yeah, if you can do those kinds of things, definitely reach out to CAP or maybe another organization that uh, that you feel compelled to, but yeah, I love that topic, time, talent, and treasure. Yeah. Love it. Love it. So Vanessa, uh, to wrap up our conversation about uh, Community Action Partnership, what's what's next for CAP in 2023? Anything um, new that you can announce or on the horizon? Or I think what, what, you know, what folks will see is you know, just more intentionality around this whole family approach, really thinking about how we not only create communities of practice within the organization and get more collaborative across the agency. We're really looking at ways that we can help um, gain curiosity about this whole family strategy with other organizations. So we just hosted in October a two-gen conference. We had about 150 folks from the community, other nonprofits, elected officials, funders come together for a day-long learning with the national organization. So we're going to be doing a lot more of that here in 2023. Um, extending this kind of framework and mindset to help kind of revolutionize the way we do the work with partners. Um, many of them are already doing good work and do whole family. Um, it just help us think more creatively about how we measure and track that practice. So that's kind of coming up. And I think for us, we're going to go deeper in learning about how we can impact equity. Um, and really, really, my heart for our team is really about culture shaping. You know, how do we continue to invest in our team? Um, create opportunities for growth and for celebration and joy in the work because we did some um, emotional intelligence analysis of our leadership team and our number one attribute as a team is problem solving. It's pretty great um, because we want right. good problem solvers, right? Thinking about this organization. But our lowest EQ score was joy. Um, and, you know, I'm paying a lot of attention to talking about and looking for celebration and joy and and learning lessons and doing all that good stuff. But like, ultimately, we've got to feel good about this work um, in terms of the people we get to do it with and do it for. That's awesome. That's thanks. Very, yeah, thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah very good. And we, and we had a comment that you would be a rock star keynote for an event. I'm going to second that comment. Thanks. Yeah. I'm gonna, very much enjoyed your time. I'm going to retire in keynoting, I think, one day. I don't know what that means. I don't even know how people do it. <laughs> but yeah. Well, I hope I hope Lancaster can keep you for many, many years to come. That's right. I'm, I mean, I'm you've settled got, in. I mean, I've you've got your entire to, 30s ahead of you. Bagels so. and the pizza. You I've learned. I go home <laughs> and I grab bagels and pizza and then it's I come back. It's fine. 
All right. Well, it's uh, Connection Cocktail time. Oh, wait. What is that? Let's okay. Get, get to know... Um, <laughs> Get to know there, Vanessa. Just there, peel back the layers of Vanessa Filbert. So there, many layers. There's no drinks. There's no drinks, sorry. Yeah. So I'll kick it off. There you go. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do in Lancaster? Oh, favorite thing to do in Lancaster. Oh, I love downtown. Especially in the summer, like a first Friday. Great. Love it. All right. Do you have a favorite annual event that you like to go to? You know, we still, love, be- we still love the New Holland Parade. Um, and even though okay. we're in, we live in East yeah. Van Peter now, we still go every yep. year to the New Holland Parade. We do love it. Now, is that uh, like a Halloween parade or a, it's like a time Memorial Day thing? It's time-ish. Or... Okay. But it's, you know, yeah. the kickoff of all things pumpkin and, you know, anywhere there's a yep. good funnel cake, those kinds of things always make our family. I'm sure, the, I'm sure the New Holland Band plays. I know that's a big thing up there. Yeah. And I think it's also like, you know, a place for like talking about like all the good things are over yeah. there. All the things that have too much butter and sugar, but I appreciate them deeply. It's cool. Yep, just mix it in there. Yeah. I love it. All right. So being from, uh, it was Brooklyn, Mm -hmm. correct? From Brooklyn. So uh, what part of Lancaster do you impart on friends and family when they come in from out of town? I would say, um, you know, I always want people when they're here, so my family comes, is to, you know, come to the city. City is so different than when we first moved here. It's really kind of grown and very vibrant. Uh, things like Southern Market are kind of different and new in the downtown area. But I think I have such a deep value for, like, our ability to drive 15 minutes and be in, in the farmland. Um, so mm-hmm. we always take folks out to, like, you know, ice cream and you know, petting zoo kind of energy just because I love mm-hmm. the diversity of that experience. Um, there's probably one thing that I love to do, my husband and I, is really just take a drive on a summer night um, and just enjoy the back roads. It's something that we have a deep appreciation for and it's really beautiful. So as long as people can get yep. that and of course, they always want to stop at the outlets. But I think if they can get those two things, they're doing good. Yeah. Very cool. You're you're not the first person to mention the the ability to be downtown and experience everything that's downtown, and then five minutes out of town, you can be in the beautiful farmland that yeah. Lancaster has to offer. Love it. Oh, we that's love, a common theme. Yeah, we love being able to like you know go get our pumpkins and our fruit, you know, all those kinds of things. We've been, I think, what seventeen years now. We go to the same tree farm and we cut down our tree as a family. So we've a lot of good traditions and yep. roots here. Cool. Oh, that's very cool. Very cool. Vanessa, this has been a joy. Uh, in parting, we had Jessica Brusick, one of our other fans. Um, she has great praise for the PAT program, Parents oh, as yeah. Teachers. Yeah, we love Parents she, as Teachers. She felt it was a great experience for her child and herself and, and just says awesome ladies that run that program. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you for that. You're doing that, Jessica. It's, all, it's always nice to hear back the positive stuff. Yeah, for world. sure. Well, thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, maybe maybe there's an additional question to the Connection Cocktail. Do you have birthday plans tonight? Like, are you going out for dinner or are you... Well, it happens to be that I'm going to a conference tomorrow. So it's, I'm, so it's in New Orleans. It's going to be great. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I will be in New Orleans by, I think, 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And I will do okay. conference things, but I will enjoy some beignets. Then you're going to go do birthday things yep. on Easy Street. 100%. That's yeah. awesome. And isn't uh, isn't the Mardi Gras stuff it's, kicking off soon? Yeah, so they're all set up. I think it starts the 20th, but there's pre-gaming that is already happening. So I've never been, so I'm excited to go. Something, uh, okay. something tells me this might have been planned this way. I will <laughs> not confirm or deny. I will not. I will say the National Community Action Organization hosts their conference every year in a different city, and it just happens to be on my birthday week. Yep. There you go. Yep. Well, yeah. travel safe. Just Thanks. all work. Well, the stars align for great people. And there you go. Yeah. You go. Thanks so much. Well, I appreciate you both. Thanks for your curiosity and your time and for hosting this for the community. This is pretty cool. Yep. Yeah. Thank yep. you. Thank you. We'll all right. You. See ya. We didn't get shut off. We didn't get shut off. We saved the day. Yeah. Yeah. If, for- you saw, if you saw us both lean in. <laughs>
we were uh, we were clicking something on the screen. Yeah, our computer was going to reset. You know, to do its uh, whatever. We had a stay of uh, weekly update. A stay of uh, program deletion as as we were doing the show. So thought it was going to just cut us off at two forty three, but we were able to hold, stave it off for another hour. It was good because Vanessa was a great guest. Oh, yeah, it was it was great. Had a history that. lesson there, curiosity lesson there, maybe ask some questions about the people around you lesson there. Yep. and yeah, uh, that was good. Yeah, it was a good time. All right. Well, if you want to be a guest on the show, um, you can go to LancasterConnects.com slash guest and fill out the form there and we'll get it all arranged and pick a date and we'll have you on the show. It's not as hard as it may seem. If yeah, I kind of like to say, if you can do Zoom, you can be on the show. There's a couple other steps to that, but uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, we'd love to have you on. So reach out that way. We do prizes on the show. We've had uh, Jessica and John battling it out. Thankfully, we have a new gift to, uh, to put give the out. Mix. Put the mix. So on the go travel bundle. You know, if you're like me and you're decrepit and busted up, these little pillows are great. I use it as a little armrest pillow in my car. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if I don't, the shoulder drops and then I hurt and then I whine and complain and my wife doesn't like it. <laughs> so that's that. So. Not so much on the go travel bundle is shoulder, elbow, helper, wife, husband, relationship, saver, pillow. So we've got that. We've got that. that that's not going to fit on the label. It's not gonna fit. We need a whole big package. Less nor more cuddle, drinkware is also your choice. Sleep better tip. Um, I don't know why it took me so long to do this, but I discovered on my phone, there's a, a night tone or a nighttime setting. Uh -huh. And it basically like removes blue light. And so if you can remove blue light two hours before bed, that's very helpful because blue light um, is uh, replicates daylight, UV light, and tricks your brain into thinking mm -hmm. it's daylight time when your brain's wanting to go to nighttime mode, sleep mode. So remove blue light. That might mean uh, turning that setting on on your phone. It might mean not watching TV. If you're not able to do either of those things, maybe just an inexpensive pair of uh, blue light blocker glasses that you can pick up at your local eyewear place, order maybe online, um, and just wear those as you're watching TV at night as you as you wrap up your day. But that would be my sleep better tip. If you want other great tips like that, go to gardenersmattressandmore.com slash sleep dash better right there on the screen. And we'll mail you a free copy of our sleep better book right there. You've, you've figured out the 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 pointing. I've done fairly good this time. I'm going to forget it by the time I come. <laughs> right, right. All right. So, uh, Gardner's mattress and more testimonial. Uh, this one comes uh, came to us yesterday from Brian uh, in Lancaster. Here, uh, extremely knowledgeable sales personnel and not pushy at all. Um, I guess that's another. Uh, or wait, no. Allowed my wife to test out pretty much every mattress they had and did not push me to buy anything. So that's that's not pressure, but pushing. Right, we, but non pushing. Sure. As we talked about before, Google always puts our, our uh, oh, yeah. reviews so into the pressure category. Now there's a pushing category. Right. Yeah, we don't uh, push you no around pushing. here. Yep. Uh, um, so ended up purchasing a new mattress here and highly recommend them. So thank you to Brian. Um, thank you to our team here at Gardner's Mattress and More um, who uh, did a fantastic job with Brian helping he and his wife pick the mattress that best suits their sleep needs. And uh, President's Day is just around the corner. I guess it's like two two weeks from now. That's right. President's Day is uh, all the sales happenings are here and ready to go. We can talk with you about all of those right. savings opportunities. When you visit, you can go to gardenersmattressandmore.com slash sales. And the information as we get it and have it is up there. And, uh, you know, look, if you buy early in the event and something else comes along, we make it right. It's really simple. These two guys right here, we get to say yes or no. We say yes. We want to keep you happy. So if, so if something comes down the line and it changes uh, in, in your favor, we make it right and we credit you. It's really simple. It doesn't have to be that big of a deal. Um, mattresses. That's right. We're not launching rockets and we're not curing cancer here. But we do take it serious and we're, um, we're always happy to help you. So we'd love to be able to earn your business and help you wake up happy. And Jonna has, is saying, great team, got bragging about you on Saturday oh, night. So, uh, yeah, I, Jonna, 
our our uh, nice Sunday sale. We had a we had a, a nice Sunday ticket. Uh, one of a handful of customers that bought on Sunday. They were the person, Jana. You were bragging oh, to you, about Jana. us. So uh, we love referrals. Yes, I, I had a note to send Jana a message, and uh, but we can do it right here. We get the podcast in. almost in person. Yeah. Podcast live stream. So thank you. But no, Jana. Jana was singing our praises and singing her mattress. Is mattresses praises? Great right. praises. And um, that person came in and bought a mattress on Sunday. Yep. And, uh, you know, I'd be remiss. Jonna is uh, an Edward Jones advisor. And I never forget the day Jonna brought to our local referral group. She was going to switch sales and, and careers from what she was doing into Edward Jones advisory. And when she shared all she had to do, it was, it was eye-opening mm-hmm. like work. Mm-hmm. To, to like do it and she did it and now she has a great office there in Willow Street I think that's where it, Willow mm-hmm. Street yep yep I think it's an enviable mm-hmm. location too if I'm remembering it correctly from when I saw the press release but she went and did the work and that's just awesome so congratulations to Jonna and um, if you need any financial uh, advisory assistance you can uh, you can reach well, I know there's legalities around all of this. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. So right, I right. don't know. Like, you I, can't say John is going to make you a whole bunch of money. That, that's, you can't say that. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, you might have just broke the rules. <laughs> I said you can't say that. Okay, yeah, good, good. <laughs> but listen, all, all jokes aside, um, John Hoover Green, Edward Jones, if that's your need or your thing, certainly be sure to check her out because we saw it. We saw her put in the work. Mm-hmm. Behind the scenes, very hard work that 99 out of 100 people would never, ever do. It's true. They might say they would, but they would never do it. And she went and did it. So there you go. So prize later time. Spin that, baby. We had, it's a, it's a, it's a two person race. Lots of comments. We'll see. We'll see if the prize later algorithm takes into account comments. Uh-huh. I don't know that it does. I think it just picks a winner. And Jonna wins. Jonna, you need this in your day. So come get it. We have them here. Thank you for being a fan. Jessica, thank you for being a fan. You're going to give up uh, your arm pillow? I might take one home because the arm pillow I have in the truck's <laughs> getting a little ragged. And I, you know, I'm a little bougie like that. I'll, yeah, I, need, I need to deal with a ratty truck pillow. No, I need to roll in a little more style. So <laughs> that's just that. So anyway, yeah. Don, thank you for tuning in. Um, Don knew what to do. She's, she's yeah. done a bunch of times and she donates her prizes back. So she got in after we spot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Spin the prize later. Don, thank you for being a fan, Jessica. Okay. Thank you. Thank you everybody for watching. And, uh, we're, uh, we're going to miss you the next few weeks. I'm simply trying to be, right. I was just like, yes, I will be gone. <laughs> knee surgery. Everything should be fine. Just a little more involved than the average one. And <clears throat> that's that. But yes, I will try to maybe dial in, not next Monday, because I will <clears throat> be on the most amazing cocktail of IV drugs by about this time next next Monday. I'm going to get Steph to like uh, patch, patch you in somehow. I'll be sitting there with my little <laughs> thing. Talk. All jokes aside, though, we wish you yes. a lot of luck with the yes. surgery. And- I'm sure I'll be, I'm in good hands. Yep. Thank yep. you. Yep. But, uh, but maybe the following week we'll tune in from uh, updates from Jeff's bed. I'll that, be, that's I'll what be, we'll call it. I'll be in my home office. I'm not going to be in bed. <laughs> Please. Can't, no, I can't do that. But yes, I, I, Don, trust me, my wife will be, um, she will be on me, on me, yep. like hardcore. You got it. Well, yep. You got to, got to follow it. So my, my father went through it and, uh, yep. Painful to go through the physical therapy, but they, they know what they're doing. Okay. So, All right. Yep. Enough about Jeff and his knee. I think that's a wrap. That's a wrap. We'll, uh, he'll see you next week on Lancaster Connects. Take care.